that large foundation models exist, that they can generate text, that they can generate images. Uh, less well known, I think, that they are generating music, although that is the big oncoming storm, I think. They can generate computer code, well, that which there is already a piece of litigation ongoing in the U.S., and of course, it's not just that that's what we're telling you to hear about, about right now. now. The big American giants, or even the small British giants associated with the big American giants. Um, but it's also China, notably, right? So we can't ignore China in this game. And China is doing very interesting things right now for regulating generative AI. May actually be leading the world on it. So, yeah, that was just to make people laugh. This was me playing a very long time ago with Mid Journey. And I went from that picture, which is my standard headshot, to the middle where I look like David Bowie, to the one on the end, which is what I look like most of the time now. <laughs> Completely frazzled. Um, that demonstrates, I'm not going to go into this in detail, the thing that everyone first noticed, I think, at the stage where we were most concerned, perhaps about images rather than language. This was phase one, as I say in the latest slide, which was that the various models, stable diffusion, DALI, et cetera, typically produced rather biased or stereotypical results. And I know that work has been going on to fracture and but it is something that has considerably worried people. Yeah. So here, very simplistically, you can see that when you put in nurse, you get women, and when you put in doctor, you get men. Yeah. Okay, there's some, there's a bit of Doctor Who mixed up in there as well, which I think is interesting, especially as Doctor Who has been a woman there. Then here is Chat GPT. Okay, so this was me last autumn. Uh, surprising my AI class, who I really felt I should introduce it to, telling them that this is how they could have written the abstract for their dissertation. <laughs> and they all went, why didn't you tell us this a week ago, before we had to hand it in? So this is another ongoing problem, just a poor shadow, which obviously is the, the complete attack on the educational system that is increasingly based on essays rather than, uh, you know, supervised exams. And I would, I have said in very places that you know essay assessment is dead i think that may be overstating it but it's not a good scene who is lillian edwards well you know she's that person who's going on in a pink jacket so this is all very dull this right this is the equivalent of vanity google searches i, I did not do this voluntarily okay somebody sent me this and i'll show you why if i put that in this is chat gpt obviously acting exactly like a search engine right you know it's not very it, this is another feature of what generative AI can do. This is me asking for authority to back up the statements about myself. And these are completely made up. Fascinatingly and extravagantly accurately made up. There is one in there, I think, that is right, which is the slave to the algorithm piece, which is obviously prevalent enough that the tokens have picked it up, as it were. Um, but the rest is, is fantastically convincingly made up. And indeed, the URL from The Guardian I clicked on, so convincing, gets you a 404 error. That URL does not exist. So this is my own little example of hallucination. Okay, You can play this game at home. Um, I also just want to emphasize, I'm not really putting this here to make any big point about Microsoft, but that there is obviously... This is not just about Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, DeepMind, Meta. This is about a giant ecology of downstream deployers of these models. And legally, that is going, I think, to raise, if not as many, maybe more problems than the actual liabilities and risks of the upstream providers. Because these downstream deployers, what's their liability if people use their, their <coughs> products? to create disinformation or to create inaccurate data or to reproduce copyright material or to process data without consent under the GDPR. What's their liability? That's a PhD. I'm not going to give you the answer to that one today, but I just want to flag it up. You know, so here again is an example of the downstream deployer, which is here Microsoft incorporating ChatGPT or Sydney, as he was known for a short while, uh, or she, because Sydney can be a female, um, having a bit of a fit of hallucination. Um, and here's an example again for any of the lawyers in the room. To, um, 
You show that the lawyers have leapt on this, in fact, and Alan and over it may be a publicity stunt or it may not, uh, are, have, have announced a huge amount of integration with Harvey, which is this downstream deployer of ChatGPT for building legal application. Okay. Right. Now, I'm, I'm going to run through a few of these. I'm already way behind the time just to say, as I said, that I'm not going to really explain the technology, but I am going to point out some things that I think are very important for considering subsequent legal analyses, okay? Um, so you need a definition, right? I'm just going to leave that one. But if you're going to regulate generative AI as a thing, you're going to need a definition of it. And that is not even, okay, or general purpose AI, as the EU AI Act calls it. And I've got a few examples later of how they're struggling with that, right? But in terms of functionality, I think the key point, obviously, is the size of the model, the fact that it's trained on unprecedentedly large data sets, okay? And I'm not even going to start the game and say how many petabytes or terabytes or how many tokens it is because it, it just gets bigger every time, except it's not going to, according to OpenAI, who say that GPT-4 is as big as it's going to get. Um, but the point is, for these sizes of training data sets, they are typically scraped without permission from the public internet, most typically by something called Common Crawl and the cleaned up version of Common Crawl, which is called Seed Ball, which stands for something very funny that William might remember, I don't. The Colossus Common Crawl. Yeah, so well, that's common to you, crawl or something. It's, it's quite funny. Um, when you're talking at that level, and that's pretty much not everything on the internet, but quite a lot of it. It's about 15 million websites, I think. It includes like most of Wikipedia, most of Reddit, uh, most of the one that they put all the code on, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes impossible to manually review either whether it's lawful, whether it's copyright, whether it's personal data, whether it involves liability risks. It, it will be impossible to manually uh, review that. Also, you, you then might say, well, if we find troubles, we'll report them. Fine. You know, we've got a notice and takedown paradigm already. In, in many areas of internet law. But then what do you do, right? I mean, as I am going to talk about in a lot more detail tomorrow, if somebody asks for their right of erasure, their right to be forgotten against chat GPT, what are the results? You know, are you asking for your personal data to be deleted from the model? Maybe. How do they find your personal data? Is it in the training set? Is it in the model? Has the model memorized it? Do you need to retrain the entire model, which will probably cost millions and take a lot of time? What then if 5 million people ask for that remedy? Um, and it reaches stages of absurdity where I think the law is going to have to start to look at things like proportionality as against effects of protection of rights. Okay, Jennifer probably knows more about this than me. I can see her nodding. Um, so computationally expensive and retraining slow. That's a very anodyne way of saying. Ah. <laughs> and another point there. The microphone's come on again. This is extremely bizarre. Is that because, as many of you will know, um, at this level of expense and time and need for, you know, vast amounts of compute capacity, this capacity is only really possible right now for a relatively small number of companies, of which names we already know and I've already mentioned. And that's got severe worries, which I'm not an expert in, on how far that entrenches already existing problems with competition in the market. How far does it entrench, as it were, the vertical dominance? So, for example, example, OpenAI drawing on Microsoft Azure servers. Um, Hugging Face are about to go in with Amazon, I understand. Um, so how far is this going to um, make the competition problems that already exist in the big tech markets worse? And I think that's going to become a really major issue. So if you look at how much it costs to train GPT-4, OpenAI have been very closed mouthed on almost everything about GPT-4. But they did say recently that it cost, someone said, did it cost 100 million? Uh, Sam Altman said, or oh, more, more. Yeah. So that is not something 
that every tiny SME can do. And to some extent, this also makes some of the complaints that I've made about the effects on open source models rather illusory because it's going to be very hard to build um, meaningful open source models yeah, because it's just so expensive. Um, there's also the point that retraining and indeed training is very computationally expensive in terms of environmental resources, right? That it's burning energy. And therefore, we've also got huge problems here from an environmental point of view, which again have just, just, I think, come to the attention of the EU. And they've started to stick in a few words about it in the very latest version of the GPAI provisions in the AI Act, right? So we've got all these problems already before we even get to the biggies. Um, the biggie, <laughs> next, next slide, is right now is probably copyright, okay? When in doubt, fear the copyright industries. I always say they are like cockroaches. You will never get rid of them. They will never die. Um, so we already have essentially the first litigation on large language models or indeed large image models, sorry, um, coming from the copyright lobbies, essentially. Well, well. From artists, from a number of artists who are suing Stable Diffusion, who produce AI-generated images in terms of whether it reaches their copyright. And we also have Getty, who are a larger player, also suing Stability AI or Stability <laughs> Diffusion, saying that Getty's photos that are used that are licensed as standard stock photos are being gobbled up rather in the parrot picture and made into their model without payment, okay, without permission, without payment, without royalties. So we are going to see a lot of copyright litigation, I think, coming soon. Good news for Clifford Chance, probably. Um, but there is a big problem there, just to be incredibly simplistic, which is that these do not involve direct copying. You know, just like the test I saw generated in 2019, it is not that they are taking these pictures and taking a little bit of them and reproducing it. It is not a collage, which is one of the claims that was made in one of the cases. It is simply a matter of looking at which pixel looks like it might come next, as I understand it. And perhaps my esteemed colleagues can go into that more. So there are considerable problems, I think, with some of the copyright litigation. Okay. And finally, obviously, these models are general. That's the whole point of them. They can do multiple things. They don't just produce pictures. Um, so if you take ChatGPT, you can use it, as Philip Hacker said, to write an invite to a kid's birthday party, right? Or you can use it to write a racist diatribe and then send it to the observer by mistake. <laughs> a little topical reference there. Um, or it can be used in a perfectly anodyne economic way, say to be integrated into a customer support line, which is what we're going to see. We're going to see all of these being powered, I imagine, by GPT APIs very shortly, because we all know how bad the customer support chatbots are on many sites. Um, it'll be used for automated hiring systems. It'll be used to check people in airports, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there's going to be a million and economic uses downstream of this technology. So that makes it very hard, as we'll see in a sec, to fit this into the model of the AI in terms of regulating AI to be trustworthy. Okay, so stay with me. Okay. Um, I think I've kind of covered the next two bullet points. So I will go over the page. Right. This is purely really, oh, right. This is purely really to demonstrate my use of parrots. Okay, so this, this is Emily Bender. Uh, who's one of the co-authors of the very famous paper uh, on stochastic parrots, which demonstrated really that AGI, I say in this context, is rubbish. These are merely models that select the next thing that seems most likely to come after the thing you already had. They are autocompletes. They are auto-suggested. Um, and in this sense, they argue that it's a stochastic parrot. It repeats in various orders, but it doesn't understand. It doesn't have theory of mind, et cetera. Um, and then that paper goes on to discuss what I've already mentioned, which is the characteristic, because you're taking just this big crawl from the internet, including sites like Reddit, which are very well known to have various biases in them. Um, you're therefore building generative AI, which will generate... Uh, biased 
staff bias text, biased images, which I already showed you. It will discriminate, it will misrepresent, and it will stereotype groups like women, Muslims, Irish people, Eastern European people, etc. It's a whole other talk about that I could show where it's fascinating how the images generate and change as you move the focus eastward across Europe. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, so that was the first phase, I think, of legal worries about large models right, was the question of bias. And that very much feeds in to what the AI Act already was kind of keyed up to deal with. So in terms of the AI Act, that's maybe not so bad. But then we've had all these other phases of worries. And I've called them, you know, phase two, no one think of the artists, which is taking us into the copyright problems that I was discussing Phase three, I think people began to think, oh, no, this is fake news on steroids. This is the best way possible to build more fake news, send it out everywhere. Okay. Um, And there are questions there about how well the existing frameworks deal with that. Now, again, this is something I'm not a total expert in, but the Digital Services Act within the EU, not here, um, is designed to have some framework for the uh, risk assessment and auditing for the algorithms used by the tech giants, by the very large online platforms, as they are going to be called, VLOPs or VLOSs for search engines. Um, And there is a strong argument, again, from Philip Hacker, who's done some really great early work on this, that these systems currently do not fit into the definitions of platforms or VLOPs within the DSA. Very glad to see Jennifer Nodi. And I think that one, again, is a huge problem that someone's going to have to deal with. I mean, to some extent, these systems are going to be integrated into things that are in the DSA. So, for example, chat Bing or integrating it into Google search. But there are also going to be examples where that is not the case, right? And the platformization, as they say, of these systems is well underway with the release of the API. And therefore, arguably, functionally, they should fit into the DSA. But you know, that's another whole piece of work. Um, and then there's the one that dearest to my heart, which I call you have zero privacy, get over it. Because it kind of like we're back in the bad old days of 2000. It's kind of like we're back in the bad old days of the very beginning of the dot-com boom, you know, when people just went, well, you know, if it's on the internet, it's public, you know, go away, F off. Um, and now we seem to be there again. You know, because these systems, these multi-million, hundred million dollar systems have been built on the assumption that any data that was out there, which includes huge, huge amounts of personal data and sensitive personal data, is fair game, right? And, you know, even within US jurisprudence, that may not always be true because there might be health data there, there might be confidential data in legal consequences, in legal circumstances, But it's very, very, very bad news if you start to throw the GDPR at it. And I have an entire talk on that that I'm giving tomorrow. Okay, so you can have that one another time. But I'm going to mainly talk about the AI Act now. That's right. Um, About 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right. Uh, (laughs) So let let me very briefly, very, very briefly run over how the AI Act works. In fact, is there anyone in this room who hasn't previously encountered the, the AI Act and this triangle? Yes, put my hand up. You should have asked it a positive way around. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So the AI Act is supposed to be risk-based, right? What they mean by that really, as far as I can understand, is that it's not really Uh, is that it's not one size fits all. They divide systems into different levels of seed risk. And the risk is characterized by the intended use of the system. You can already see how badly this maps to generative AI or general purpose AI, as it's known in the AI Act. So there are four categories of risk. I am not going to go through all this right. normally as a whole goal. There's the ones that you, you can't accept at all, so they're prohibited. That's the top of the triangle, the little red top. 
And that, that includes things like, to some extent, uh, police use of face recognition in public places, unless there's an exception, and there are millions of exceptions. But that's the general idea. Okay? So there was a campaign about whether police use, law enforcement use of face recognition should be banned in Europe, as it has been in a few cities already. But the real action in the AI Act is in that one that's sort of pink in the little triangle and it's sort of pink on my uh, addendums, yeah? And that's high risk. And as I say, and I have complained about this already at length in the work I did for Ada Lovelace, this is based on building a list, a fixed list of types of systems that have a certain intended use. And here are the intended uses, right? So it's basically that column to the right where you can see you've got a number of things which are obviously risky, such as the biometric identification of people by people other than law enforcement, right? Or the um, educational systems that gather huge amounts of data of students and like, profile them on that basis. Or employment systems, which is one I'm very interested in. So hiring, firing, algorithmic management. Do you get promoted on the basis of huge amounts of data that we gather that you don't understand? Right. Um, low enforcement, migration systems. These are all obviously big and consequential to society, right? But they are all defined. They are intended uses for one purpose. They are not general purpose. Um, if you fall into high risk, if you're a provider making a system that falls into that high risk list, then you become subject if you either are in Europe or you plan to sell into Europe, which is most companies, um, then you are subject to these high-risk requirements. Now, notably, look at the one, the one I put in bold, data quality under Article 10. This looks like something we should be very interested in, in terms of regulating generative AI and general purpose models. So data quality is aimed at this pervasive problem of bias that's been identified in machine learning since at least 2015-2016. And it says that the, the testing data, the training data should be relevant, representative, free of errors and complete. And you could look not just at individuals, but at groups, such as women, Muslims, Irish people, whatever. Um, that would be a nice thing to achieve for generative AI. How conceivably possible is it? Okay. And then there are various other things there, such as keeping a risk management system, so assessing the risks of the system, trying to mitigate them, passing down information about those risks to the downstream deployers so that they can deal with it. Um, transparency, again, to the downstream deployers so that they have some idea of what's going on with the model and so forth. <laughs> um, so... We would like, I think, some of the high-risk requirements perhaps to apply to generative AI, although that leaves a huge aching hole of how we are practically going to implement it. Okay, it's just going to be the AI Act. Then. But then, right, as I said, the AI Act not optimised for this, and we have this lovely quote from uh, Natalie Helberger. It is not easy being a tech regulator these days. The European institutions were working hard towards finalizing the AI Act in the autumn. That was last, that was this year. And then generative systems come along. And as a result, we are already two months behind, even in the European Parliament reaching agreement on this stuff. And that's because generative AI. So again, I'm not going to go into any of this in detail because I haven't got very much time. There is a big fight going on as to how you do Fine generative AI. Early attempts were wildly off east, I would say, in that there was no emphasis on the size of the, tra the training sets. Um, and therefore, it could have applied to very simple systems that were not generative AI at all. The new one from the European Parliament in March is better, and it says an AI system that is trained on broad data at scale is designed for generality of output and can be adapted to a wide range of tasks. So that is better. 
Okay. But the big fight, apart from the definition, is who carries the can, right? And this has been going on since about last summer. Okay. So this is, can be perceived as a fight between the upstream developers, the open AIs, the Googles, the Metas, etc., and and the deployers, who confusingly, I have to say, I always say this, are called users in the AI ask. Do not, it does not mean data subjects. It means the people who buy it from OpenAI can then use it in their systems to sell to other people. So there's an argument that was very pervasive at, um, in the European Parliament, I think, that the developers are the people who should carry the liability and the risks because they are the ones who are kind of akin to manufacturers, if you like, in the product safety regime that the AI Act was derived from, right? They, they have control of the process of development. They know what's in the training set. We don't know what's in the training set. We have made educated guesses about, say, stability because they are an open source product, you know, mostly to their detriment lately. Um, but we have no idea about GPT-4 where they haven't released any details about what's in the training sets at all. We've got educated guesses again that they're using common crawl, they're using C4. But what else are they using? What parts of it have they cut out? What filters have they introduced, etc.? We don't know any of that, right? We don't know the weights. We don't know how they've adjusted the algorithms. So there is a strong argument that, the, you know, the practical control and power to change things as well as to build it lies with the upstream developer and therefore they should be the one who takes the risk, who takes the liability. Okay. And indeed, as again, various people have said, the high risk obligations mostly arise at development stage. So if we look at that obligation to try to get the training sets right, to get it free of bias, to get it accurate, then that obviously is something that really can only be dealt with by, say, open AI, right? Can't really be dealt with by the downstream deployers, okay? So they have the practical power, and they also are the ones who will make the money, you know, not only from delivering it directly, but also from licensing it to this vast ecology of downstream developers. So why shouldn't they take the risk? So the counter argument to that, which has again been made very forcibly, is this is unforeseeable risk because it is general and it could be used for anything. Right? It could be used to build a terrorist disinformation system. It could be used to build something that generates poetry, which I have done myself. Um, and is that fair? Will we be destroying the golden goose? Will anyone go forward with $100 million training if they, they, end, they think they will end up with, you know, $20 million fines every time they build a new model? Okay, so that's the problem, basic problem of economics. If you go to the deployers, the downstream deployers, in the original version of the AI Act, way back when, they would only have had any liability if they made a substantial modification, this was then Article 28, I think, to the AI system, which effectively meant enough of a modification that they became the new upstream provider. In almost all cases, it seems to me, especially where you are taking the product via an API, this is not going to occur, right? Because if you take it via the API, you're really, you don't know what's in the training set. You don't know what's in the algorithm. You don't have the power to change it. You're just taking speed, as I understand it. Um, and therefore, how could you be making a substantial modification? And so you get this point that, again, has been made forcibly by various people, such as like Neil and Freddie Borgesius, that um, it is not practical for these downstream employers to fix the systems, to audit them even, um, and to acquire access to the upstream source code. Because with open AI, as I've said repeatedly, they're not stability, but mostly for these systems, they are closed code. They are proprietary because there are millions invested in them, right? Um, so that becomes a problem. And it seems to me the only answer, and this is what's beginning to develop, is going to be a pick and mi mix, as I'm calling it. There's going to be some responsibilities placed on the upstream provider, and there's going to be some left 
to announce the deployers. And it is going to be very complex indeed. I think that's my main takeaway. So in the, in the couple of minutes I've got, I'm not going to read through all this, right? You can have the slides, that's fine, okay? But we have various back and forth. So the way the European process works, if you don't know, is there is an initial commission proposal. We got that way back two years ago now. Um, then the council, which is really the political wing of the EU, comes out with its version, which was finalised at the end of last year, December 2022. And the European Parliament also finalises a version, which is theoretically our democratic representatives. They are struggling. They were meant to have done it by the end of March. They're still going. And that is mainly because of generative AI. Um, so the council has generally leaned towards being slightly more supportive Gen AI, if you like. So they were saying that they would be, it would be GPAI, general purpose AI, that's their phrase, would be high risk if it might be used as a high risk AI system. That in itself is a huge shift from intended use. But the European Parliament at points has been saying all Gen AI to go into high risk, right? Even if it's only sold on to people who do use it to generate children's party invitations one example. So this again seems disproportionate. And, you know, what are we going to do about this? One suggestion again was to kick it down the line to the commission. Like, let's just say, oh, it'll be okay, right? And the commission will fix it all with delegated acts after the AI Act has passed. That seems to have been pushed back. I thought that was a disaster. And I am so not going to read all this out. Um, this is what came out on Thursday in which there was a whole new scheme in the European Parliament in which they are now distinguishing between what they call foundation models, which look to me a lot like most of it, GPAI, right? An AI system that is trained on broad data at scale is designed for generality of output and can be adapted to a wide range of distinctive tasks. Right, you know, say it with me if you've heard that before. That was the previous definition of GPAI. They're distinguishing that from something called GPAI, right? I don't know what it is. It looks to me like the training data sets. It looks like Leon or Common Crawl. But I'm not sure because the only example that we seem to have been given is unlabeled data that need further training, such as algorithms developed to recognize skin cancer. So perhaps we can have some help from our experts over there. Um, and it also, I think there's an implication in some of the negotiation that's been going around that however the risks are allocated, there might be an attempt to kick them down to the deployers or even the users by contractual clauses. I mean, this is a very familiar commercial ploy, right? You know, if you use this, then you take on all responsibility and you say that you will indemnify open AI if there is any suit for copyright or libel or anything like that, right? So again, one of the things that is knocking around, <laughs> you don't see that, do you? I've just got notifications coming up. Um, is an idea from consumer law, which I think might be very helpful, which is that the upstream provider, so again, say OpenAI, would not be able to impose an unfair contractual clause on the downstream users or deployers. Okay, and that again is a very familiar idea from unfair commercial practices and so forth. And I'm in favor of that, particularly as somebody who is researching right now, I'll put in a plug, uh, the terms of service of various generative models. I was going to go on to say there's all these other ways that we might attack this, but I'm not going to. We could ask about it in questions if you want. So I'll maybe just leave that slide up so anyone can pick and mix from that thing like but please pick um privacy and data protection because i don't know much about all the others and i will stop there thank you very much Nadia. brilliant thanks so much for, for introducing all of those fantastic points these foundation models are really exciting technology presenting very uh very exciting opportunities but of course we want to get things right in the society um, i think lillian's given us a great well stop tour of some of the thinking and also helps us to understand the sort of quite a bit of confusion so we back and having that then and work out um this yeah Kiara, do you mind coming up to show us how people push into the side yeah yeah i'm just gonna share
So in, in a couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to go over to our great uh, panelists to introduce themselves and give us a few quick thoughts. Um, let me introduce them while we're waiting. Um, we've got William Isaac from DeepMind who helps lead their, uh, their ethics and society team. Um, we've got uh, Arnav Joshi who leads Clifford Chance's work and move on digital ethics. And I think that we've got Carlos. Do we have Carlos joining the moment? Uh, no. Not at the moment. Not yet. He's we may we may have Carlos joining from Big Science a little bit later, but even if we don't, we've got fantastic panelists nevertheless. Um, hopefully, Garrett. Yeah. There, there's a Slido link. So please start you know, thinking about what questions you want to ask. I'll give you just a few ideas to be thinking about and get started if, you, if you're having trouble. Um, there are these big questions about developers versus employers and where should uh, responsibility liability sit? Are there good analogies? You know, is this like electricity generators? Is it like um, computer manufacturers? Is, is there some other better analogy? Um, we can get into the technicalities of things like exemptions from research or you know, how exactly are things like to work through. Uh, we definitely want to get into what are other jurisdictions doing and what's good and bad about other jurisdictions. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned, Alina, was that you thought that that it was going to be very difficult to, to have open source models. If we get Carlos on, then he can speak to that. But certainly we've seen interesting developments, things like Alpaca that I'm sure some of you know about. The claim was that for $600, they could produce something that was almost as good as GPT-4, but um, still questions around that. Um, and uh, potentially, if we have time later on, we might get to, the, to, to an exciting question Lillian suggested. She claimed that perhaps the notion that this is heading towards AGI is rubbish. Is that really true? Is it not true? And does it matter legally? If we have time, we'll, we'll get onto that. Um, so please start populating Slido. Chiara, um, is everyone okay if we take that down? Has everyone had a chance to, to get the link or, the, or to take a picture? Because we're going we're gonna to put up the actual uh, top questions soon so you can see what's coming up there. But I don't want to do that until people are comfortable with know how to ask the questions. Okay. Good. Good. So, um, Gerard, if you can switch, please, to showing the questions. So we do have, we have Carlos, who great is with us. Brilliant. So first I'm going to ask William and then Arnav and Carlos to say a few words in response to William, and we'll get into the discussion. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, that was a very fascinating conversation. And uh, yeah, I think we'll probably get into more details as the questions come up. Um, I guess from me, I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff I agree with in there. I mean, I think the phases that we've seen, um, I, I do say, I don't, I'm surprised that the European Union felt they were caught off guard because as you point out in your talk, this is not a new thing, <laughs> right? So like whether it was like, you know, three years ago when we were talking about like GPT-2 to now, this is, I mean, this has always been kind of a subplot of the kind of general kind of like development of AI systems. So uh, I am a bit surprised, but I will say, I would say in terms of the public discourse, right? Um, one thing, we, it seems like a common discussion when we're talking about AGI or AI what is AI? What is machine learning? What is a use case and versus what is a model? And we seem to be bouncing around and using these terminologies in different ways. And I look at the regulation and it seems pretty clear that up until maybe the last six months, we were defining AI and machine learning as things related to facial recognition, right? Biometric scoring, right? So like kind of retractable, very practical use cases that we saw in the world. And so now we're kind of stumbling around this broader question, which is like, what do you do with these large scale systems, which are not necessarily developed in house, but are developed in some centralized actor and then distributed more broadly. And so this is a kind of struggle, not just in terms of the technology, but the infrastructure, you say the value chain of how these systems emerge and get distributed. Um, and so I think those raise very interesting questions and I, I'm, I'm excited to get into them because at least uh, in my kind of hat as a kind of ethics and society researcher, we think about risk uh, across the board, but obviously being based in DeepMind, we are on the developer side of this value chain. So we often think a lot about uh, this quite frankly, just this question of scale, right? There are lots and lots and lots of ways we can kind of analyze and assess the way models fail, but it also, we don't know what the kind of like downstream applications are. So like, it's very interesting to kind of have this kind of dichotomy because even if you're thinking about responsibility, there are also challenges that, you know, you can try to have some foresight and try to foresee 
what the world will look like when you release a model, but you don't have perfect foresight. So like the question is, is even for the regulators, which is like, what kind of analyses do you do now? Uh, how do you learn and update your understanding of risk as things get deployed? And that's obviously going to lead to some challenges. But I think at least what we're having these conversations is very useful for us to be able to set some ground rules early and then iterate and learn over time. Um, I think other questions that I have from the discussion that I think I'm, I'm just more excited to get into it. So I'll, I'll say my I'll save my kind of like time. And if there's questions that people thought I missed, I'm, I'll be happy to. You could find that top one. I do not understand this difference between foundations. Let, 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 let's let's come back to that. Yeah, I, I have a lot on that, but I'll, I'll come back to it. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to these questions in, in a couple of minutes. But um, what I might ask William is obviously speaking entirely in personal capacity. Yes. So feel free. Not not to have to represent your organization. Is there is there one thing you would like to see in regulation of foundation models? Um, I, I would like to see stronger guidelines around evaluation. I, I think, you know, one of the things that, I mean, okay, taking off my deep mind hat, I mean, obviously, if you look at GPT-4, I mean, using the kind of like LSAT or like, uh, like the ACT test as a way to evaluate capabilities is probably not the way we should go. But I think we need to have much stronger guidelines on what it means to evaluate harm, um, and how we communicate that to the public. I do think that is going to be a critical, it's, I think it is the fulcrum for all regulation that you're talking about, whether it's foundation models or GPIs, right? Ultimately, if you can't actually map on risk to ways you can measure it, I don't know how you set guidelines or thresholds for safety. And so, and I think that, I mean, and I would just say, if we're, if we're really getting to it, um, I would say there we should delineate between model-centric evaluations, which I think a lot of large labs do. That's very easy for them. But what about the interactive evaluation? So you mentioned misinformation. Uh, you have platforms that are deployed to 100 million users. Um, there are going to be interactive effects. There are going to be effects that go beyond just what you can assess from the model. And right now, we're completely blind to what impacts those currently have. And so if we're talking about what is like the delineation between model developers and model deployers, um, the kind of cumulative effect of saying, I'm going to release this to some end number of users, and I don't know the effect on what it's going to be on them. Um, that's probably a question mark that needs to be resolved if we're really talking about uh, product safety as a kind of framework for regulation. We'll definitely get into that more, but but of course, it, you've identified a really a lot more challenges. They're opening a whole new box. Yeah. How, how are we going to do this evaluation? Can we do it in advance of releasing? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll take. I'll keep maybe keep my mic on. But yes, uh, I mean, I think there's there's two different models you can approach it, right? If you set, you could say like we're going to use these as blockers and say like there's certain categories of evaluation that need to be done before any kind of model or product is released. Um, you know, this is similar to like a FDA model. Right. But there's also kind of like post-release monitoring. Right. So there's things that you will learn after release. And so the question is, are you setting a high enough baseline or threshold for initial release and then kind of iteratively learn or evaluate a monitoring? And if you see things, you can kind of have the capacity to recall or pull things or you can implement new ways of kind of monitoring how the models behave uh, after deployment in ways that make sense to balance like the benefit of the technology with the risk that you see. Now, this is not perfect, but I think this balances the tension that, you know, we are in the unknown, right? Like a lot of these systems that we're using and deploying, we don't exactly know what the kind of scale of risk are going to be at different levels. But the kind of like knee jerk to say you should release anything is a little tough. But also simultaneously, you can say, like, just throw it over the fence and see what happens. You can calibrate between these two extremes and say, like, you know, if you only if you have some confidence, you can release it on a smaller scale. As you monitor and learn more, you can expand the scope of release. And I think that like putting in a regime like that makes more sense to me. And I think balances, I think a lot of the kind of like uh, right now, just kind of polarizing debate about whether or not you should just kind of throw everything in the bin and not do anything. And at the same time, like full on hype, which is like just do everything, and go 100 miles per hour without thinking about the considerations. Excellent. So just, just to stir things up a bit, again, entirely in personal capacity, um, make it a bit more concrete. Would, do you think GPT-4 was released too early? Oh, the six-month pause. I mean, I, no, I mean, okay, if I'm being fair to, to OpenAI, um, I, I don't know if everyone has, but I've read their, their system card in great detail. Um, so they spent about six months or so prior to uh, the completion of their training 
just doing safety evaluations, right? So, like in terms, like, well, we should delineate between GPT four versus Chat GPT. No, I'll, 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 I'll reserve comments about you know whether or not they rush, but I, I would say in terms of GPT four, they had a clear documentation and a plan of sets of evaluations. But this goes back to my point. Um, you know, the companies are largely setting the guidelines for evaluation uh, within the within in house, and they're using in house metrics. And there's no transparency on what those metrics are, right? So, like, even as this like, a baseline, the system card was certainly a great piece of documentation and informed the public about what they were doing. But ultimately, you know, should that be it? Should that be the most that is required by organizations to be able to communicate what they're doing in terms of safety and what thresholds they're setting for what safe release looks like? So I think even within that conversation, if it's too early or not, um, you know, that's kind of a product of what they did and what decisions they made. And the most we know about it is through this documentation that they provided. So I would say, yeah, it, 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 with more information, we can make that, like, to, like, make that determination. But without it, it's still a bit opaque as to whether or not they did enough or should have waited longer or what standards they set. Thank you very much, William. Anav, what would you like to address? Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. I, I think I'll um, uh, second Will. That, that, that was a great talk by Lillian, uh, issues with the mic notwithstanding. <laughs> um, I think maybe I'll like to start broader and then from a regulatory perspective and then narrow down into um, some specific issues and, and very happy to answer some of the legal-ish questions um, as well. I think going back to the core question that we're sort of looking at here, which is around whether uh, the, the EU AI Act is sufficient to address large language models and generative AI, um, sadly, I would think that the answer is is kinder, um, uh, sort of yes and no. And I, I think for that, I'd like to draw parallels um, with the other large Brussels effect, and I'll get to explaining what that in, uh, in a second, um, law that we have at the moment, which is the GDPR. Uh, so we had the Edward Snowden um, uh, exposés in 2014, Cambridge Analytica 2016, GDPR kicks in 2018, after something like 18,000 or was it 8,000 rounds of um, changes. Uh, we've seen that the, the um, and five years on, we're, we're about to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the GDPR, and we're still grappling with how how well it's working, how well we're going to be able to enforce it. So that's sort of uh, point one. Um, the EU AI Act has been, was first released in, I think, April of 2021. Uh, we're now going to see, the soonest we're going to see it come into force comprehensively is going to be 2025, if we're being optimistic, right? Because we go into the commission, the trilogues happen, and so on and so forth. Um, um, when it comes to an area like AI and AI regulation, where forces sort of keep halting every couple of years, um, we saw that with facial recognition, we saw that with deep fakes, now we're seeing it with generative AI. Um, the problem is that the speed at which things are being developed and put out put into the market um, will sadly likely mean that many of the risks that are likely to become systemic and embedded and out there are probably at this point likely um, to already be sort of structured risks before the AI Act even comes in. Mm -hmm. um, so what are we looking to do in the interim? There are, to my mind, um, two different approaches that, that are currently being taken. Most of the overwhelming uh, majority of regulatory focus continues to be in the data space. So, so we're looking at data and then we're looking at compute, right? So uh, what data do you actually need? Um, build these models and put them in the market. Um, and then what hardware abilities do you actually need to make those happen? Um, when we look for the data side of things, the most of what we're seeing from a sort of industry practitioner's perspective is um, large organizations, whether that's deployers or users, um, doubling down on the regulatory and contractual and legal instruments they already have. Things like uh, the GDPR in Europe are incredibly powerful. Um, I, I think we're going to see start seeing action from antitrust regulators in this space as well. Um, the, the example from the Garante, uh, which is the, the big sort of uh, first off the box um, European GDPR supervisory authority who stepped in, said you've had this minor breach, but it looks like there's wider issues here. There are problems with transparency, some of which will um, touched on is, is critical in a space like this. 
uh, lawful basis and so on and so forth. Um, so we've started seeing some of that come in. Uh, we've seen a huge flurry of uh, debate, but also um, contractual doubling down uh, and, and disputes um, flying when it comes to intellectual property enforcement. So a lot of folks are relying on the power of their intellectual property capabilities and existing contracts uh, to say, A, please don't use our information with, uh, without uh, corresponding licensing. Um, and the other thing that we're obviously seeing is, is people doubling down on acceptable use policies and telling their employees, you need to be really careful before you put anything into these interfaces. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that. We're also seeing some really good practice around the things like uh, model cards, uh, the use of model cards for training large language uh, models. Again, it's a bit of a bringing a knife to a gunfight sort of um, uh, thing because of this is not what model cards were designed to do. But we're seeing some really interesting developments, sort of self-regulatory developments happening um, in that space as well. So I think it's going to take a number of these and many more um, uh, uh, approaches from a regulatory perspective, from a legit legislative perspective, uh, to successfully and comprehensively govern what's going to happen with large language models going forward. Um, I'd say we're, we're at a sort of by 110 if I were to score our current capabilities in this space, uh, of which I think the AI Act is likely to bring us to maybe a seven if we can get there fast enough. And then I've got some perspectives on things like U.S. regulation and um, the regulation of China, which we can come around to. Yeah, particularly with, with your um, global law firm hat, given you started to give ratings out of 10. Um, and <laughs> five out of 10, also, I'm not sure, it's, is EU going to get from five to seven? And where's U.S.? Where's U.K.? Where are the places? I think, um, say, so if we uh, go from, to get from five to seven, we would have to see how quickly we, we can, you know, uh, get through the dialogue stages and get the uh, the act actually in force uh, and what level of Brussels effect it still has, given that when it comes to AI, unlike data protection, we've got 650 plus uh, million users, uh, data subjects on the GDPR, um, where things like data rights matter to people everywhere around the world. So whether you're in China, the US or um, Latin America, Asia, uh, people care about their data rights more and more. Um, so when the Brussels effect went in 2018 off the back of several other scandals is if you, when you give users in Europe a set of rights, people in America and elsewhere started asking, well, hold on, I'm dealing with the same big tech company. Why do I not have the same um, set of rights? So it became a bit of a North Star. And that's what sort of really compounded the Brussels effect. Of GDPR. Whether we're going to see that with um, <laughs> AI, it, I think remains to be seen. Much of this tech is being developed in the US, but so we're going to see lots of it, I think, is starting to come out of, of China as well. So whether this the European model can still say, hold on, this is the, this is the right approach to, to dealing with this, uh, and this is what you need to follow, I think remains to be seen. I don't see um, anything particularly promising coming out of the US on the data regulatory side at the moment. There's a proposal at the moment out, which I think is due for consultation. It's open for consultation until July from the uh, NSIG, I want to say. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Alphabets. Yeah. Not this. After which we're going to see, likely going to end up seeing a sort of slow and steady, largely self-regulatory based approach in the U.S., uh, there are, as, as Lillian mentioned, uh, when we start to stray into things like children's data privacy uh, or health data, there are um, things like COPPA and HIPAA, again, a, a lot more acronyms uh, there, which um, regulators in the U.S. may be able to use. We also have um, uh, some regulation emerging in New York that you might be aware of already around algorithmic transparency which could be uh, um, used. And then when something goes seriously wrong, uh, there is, of course, um, the FPT's wide range of powers in this space um, as well on the second side um, of that uh, key regulation. Uh, the other point I'd like to briefly touch on is this the geopolitical element of generative AI regulation and use. Um, uh, you, building and training models at this scale requires a lot of compute capacity. Uh, I think the first um, GPT. I think GPT-3, uh, based on what Opeo I mentioned, uh, and I know you alluded to this earlier, Lillian, I think was trained on 45 terabytes of, of information. Uh, you need a uh, world-leading uh, sort of first-shattering GPU to be able to make that happen. 
Now, a lot of the discussion, interestingly, has been around uh, around the AI arms race has been that if the US companies don't build it, the Chinese will or the Russians will, or someone else is going to build something really powerful and it's going to knock us all out of the water. Um, the US already has regulation and export controls on the level of uh, GPU um, capacity that's in the exporting uh, to China. Um, I think most recently, they forced one of these regulations forced NVIDIA, whose, whose um, chipsets are, are the most um, web semiconductors that are most commonly used to develop uh, general yeah. AI applications, where they forced them to tweak their H100, I think it's called, um, chipsets uh, to reconfigure to something called H800, which dramatically reduces the chip to chip um, transfer speeds, which then concurrently means they can't really develop very um, yeah. powerful general AI applications off the back of it. Since then, we've seen Japan and the Netherlands follow similar um, uh, regu- follow on with some similar regulation, and I think we're only going to see things like these um, restrictions on the compute side to, uh, grow further and further. Obviously, there's the open question of what happens to generative AI development in the West. Meanwhile, um, the Chinese regulation, I think, is another really interesting one. So going back to, again to, to the presentation for a second, the EU AI Act is a horizontal regulation. What that means is it looks at risk rather than very specific narrow use cases. Obviously, we've got the annexes, which were meant to future proof uh, for this. And I completely disagree with the, the, uh, um, the MEP who's the current rapporteur for uh, the AI Act saying, oh, we have no idea about generative AI. We're suddenly thinking about it. Uh, because it's also at cross purposes with the objective of this being horizontal regulation, because you've got the sort of horizontal risk-based approach, then you've got these annexes, and then you keep throwing things like spatial recognition, deep fix, and general purpose AI in there. Um, the Chinese have a very different approach, and lots can be said about their approach to you know, democracy and regulation and so on. But when it comes to actually getting things done in short time frames, uh, we're talking about the April 2021 proposal for the AI Act. We're now in 2023. We're looking at 2025 uh, before it becomes regulation. Uh, the Chinese have a vertical approach to regulation, which means they look at one specific use case. So they look at um, GANs or they look at um, deep fakes or they look at generative AI in this instance and it's taken them four months to go from start to finish uh, to get, well not finish, but um, issue draft regulation which is now a public competition and a lot of what they're discussing and I'm told Lillian you'll have views on this um, as well so it focuses on um, uh, specifically on how they're going to regulate generative AI and who's going to be responsible. So I'll, I'll stop here, but I will say that I think, when it comes to... Yeah, Chinese, I think people, yeah. people might be particularly interested, if, if you don't mind briefly commenting, how, how would you compare and contrast these new Chinese rules with you? So I'm, uh, being a lawyer, I'm going to have to cite from some notes. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> very, very... <I> <laughs> <laughs> no, if you, uh, yeah. no, I'm going to um, So we've got a couple of their key proposals that I can cover. So I mentioned that it's taken them only four months uh, to get from start to finish. Um, uh, So the proposal mentions that uh, generative AI applications must exclude content infringing intellectual property rights, uh, easier said than done. Uh, They must ensure the data's veracity, accuracy, objectivity, and diversity. So borrowing largely from um, the EU's AI proposal that it stands. (laughs) Uh, must adopt measures to filter inappropriate content created by generative AI. And here's the interesting one. Optimize algorithms to prevent the generation of such, such content within three months. So going back to, I think, Lillian's point on what happens once it's already out there, how do you retrain and how do you fix the errors? They're saying you need to get this done in three months and provide us proof. You also need to, by the way, go to see it, uh, the CAC and seek specific security approvals, which you, one needs to for many, many things in uh, China, but also for generative AI models. So that, that for me was a really standout one. Um, you, uh, use, uh, sorry, deployers are required to enable the use of tagging mechanisms to identify content and video that's specifically created by generative AI. Um, uh, companies providing access to APIs are responsible for all content produced by them. So they, at the moment, there's no space in the, well, uh, we may need to read this in a little bit more detail, but an overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming degree of the responsibility at the moment lies with the developer and the deployer and not the user. Um, yeah, so, so that's the sort of uh, 
key point. Just come from the responsibility and accountability. It stays with the developer of the yes. original software, yeah. not the deployer. Yeah. 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 yeah, very very interesting. Thank you. We, we may come back to that. We, we want to give a chance for Carlos to come in. Um, Carlos, I, I hope you're still with us, and I hope we're going to be able to see you. Brilliant. Can you can you share a few thoughts with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Speak speak up, and maybe just tell us a little bit about your organization, and then and then share your thoughts, please. Yeah. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for the, for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm Carlos. I am currently Tech and Regulatory Affairs Council at Hugging Face, uh, an AI platform startup. We are called the GitHub of, of machine learning. Basically, anyone can upload and download either pre-trained models or even training data sets in our platform. We are very, very much open source or, or related open licenses focused. And of course, uh, we are very much, as all of you, uh, focused on the EUAA Act. And uh, for today's uh, for today's discussion, the EUAA Act and uh, the focus on foundation models or prior. So some minutes ago, we were, Lilian, I think, was making this distinction uh, made by um, the, one of the latest uh, regulatory um, proposals, which is a distinction between foundation model and general purpose AI system, which at the end of the day is just technic a technical approach uh, and a technical basically dichotomy between the soul of the of the software application or ML powered application, which is the foundation model, and their a more commercial based approach, which is the general purpose AI system, which is more like the model implemented within uh, a software um, application, right? So I think the first, uh, and I am not going to spend um, to invest so much time on this because I think I assume we all. Um, can you hear me, right? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, is on the main or the massive challenge uh, that European institutions have within um, the EU AA Act. I think Lilian's example on, on this difference between a foundation model and general purpose AA system is just one of them. Uh, and basically it targets the challenge of, uh, uh, at this moment, the European Parliament um, or the regulator to keep the pace of innovation within or in parallel, in parallel with a regulatory process, which is just massive. So if every single week or every single month we have new foundation models capable of doing a total different yeah. things, yeah. Like yeah. every single month to keep updating or even proposing new hardcore or regulatory modifications, right? So this, uh, it is not just a regulatory challenge, sometimes it's even a regulatory process. Um, so I think uh, Lillian also, and I keep uh, basing myself on, on her presentation, was mentioning also uh, the last um, proposed version by the Council. So the general approach of the Council, Article 4, specifically dealing with uh, general proposed AI systems. And it's very interesting, the article, because with, uh, within Article 4, we have Article 4C, and Article 4C basically states that if you want to uh, make openly available or even commercialize on an open basis your general proposed AI systems, you have to specifically, um, let's say specifically, forbid the use of the AI system for every single one of the identified high-risk scenarios. Now, this challenge totally the main uh, idea or core ideal of open source, right? Because the main idea of open source and traditional open source licenses, such as permissive licenses as the Apache 2.0 license, MIT license, or we can go also to Creative Commons um, BI for zero license, so very open and permissive licenses, tailored years ago, not for a new type of artifact, such as machine learning models or even data sets, uh, but more for broad internet digital content or even source code um, are nowadays uh, struggling with uh, this kind of new regulatory approach. Because if uh, in uh, two or three years now, um, this article, Article 4C, stays uh, within the EUA Act, now I am not going to be able to open source uh, a foundation model or whatever um, big uh, model on, a, on an open source basis, meaning an official open source license or a creative commons open source license, right? So uh, you are already, um, let's say, placing some kind of economic incentives or pressure uh, on market participants to uh, keep developing things on an open basis, but 
having to innovate from a legal or compliance strategy perspective. Um, from our side, for instance, we've been pushing uh, forward and developing one new tool that we call Rails uh, or Responsible AI Licenses, licenses enabling royalty-free and open access uh, to the licensed machine learning artifact. It can be a machine learning model, it can be a training, testing, validation data set, so basically any type of machine learning feature. For the sake of, of, of this event, I think we are going to focus on machine learning models. Um, so with these licenses, you can license the model on an open um, and, uh, and royalty-free basis. However, at the same time, you set a specific set of use restrictions in which you do not want or you do not allow the model to be used. For instance, if uh, the model is an NLP large language model, um, focus the large language model, uh, which was not uh, initially pre-trained uh, to provide medical advice or medical results interpretation, therefore you can place a restriction on the use of this model specifically to provide medical advice or medical uh, results interpretation. This means that if you want to fine tune the model and embed it within a medical chatbot app, basically you cannot uh, because the initial developer uh, is concerned about the performance or the use of the model uh, within this specific context. And this is very interesting because we are getting into the interrelation or articulation between different AI governance tools. How do you come up with this set of use restrictions or contractual use restrictions within uh, a license? Basically because the license is going to be informed um, on other or from other uh, different uh, AI governance or documentation tools, such as I think uh, uh, one of the speakers was mentioning it before, model cards, right? So model cards are these documentation mechanisms that are starting to be well established in the industry as even a de facto standard for documentation or open and transparent documentation practices uh, within uh, the AI community. A high quality model card might include a lot of information which is required for high-risk AI systems by the EUA Act, such as the, in, the intended pull post, for instance, but also even the technical limitations or technical capabilities of the model. If a high-quality model card give, gives me the set of technical limitations, technical capabilities, and the intended purpose of the model, then I can infer and transpose this information into the into legal uh, language in the license with a set of use restrictions, right? So this Dr. is just... Carlos, excellent. Can I just make sure I understand? I think you're saying that a, a, a potential big challenge to open source providers like yourself... Sorry, we're excited about uh, right? it's very excited. Very excited. Um, the, uh, the potential <laughs> challenge to open source providers like yourself is is this issue that uh, there's a lot of um, emphasis placed on you as the provider of this. This you may get in trouble because anyone can use it, and uh, the restrictions that 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 should make you liable for that. And therefore, you develop this Rails set of uh, legal licenses to enable you to be very focused. Is that fair? Yeah, that's one point, uh, or partially one point. So I think one thing is, again, to go back to this kind of dichotomy between, uh, on, from a technical perspective, between the model and the AI system as such. The AI system as such is the model embedded within a software application, so an ML-powered uh, application. That's an AI system. A model, a foundation model, if you want just a model as such, just a file with a bunch of numbers, right? You have to implement it into code and create basically an app in order to uh, use or generate content using um, the model. That's a core distinction that we still do not know how the EU regulator is going to approach this. So Lilian's example, this differentiation again, between foundation model and GPI is one way that maybe they are trying to approach prior to this, uh, they are not still um, sure how they are going to tackle this. Because if you tackle a general proposed AI system, you are tackling an AI-powered software app. You are not tackling the model as such. And again, mentioning uh, Lilian's presentation, Lilian was mentioning Article 10 on data governance, uh, but there is no article on model governance as such as an, as an isolated for uh, application but at the end of the day it's either one model or a system of models interacting between each other and powering uh, this uh, software application right so this is uh, this is my vision for the moment being and i really still don't know how this is going to play out at least from the side of the european parliament very good thank you and i, I know we've only got about 10 minutes left but can, can you briefly carlos just give us some thoughts on an issue which has come up a few times which is is it um so some people have the impression that it's not possible for anyone other than big tech 
to have the uh, resources and capability to do anything significant in the space of foundation models. Would you challenge that? Of course. I mean, I think uh, the, there has to be some challenges. We are, we are one of them. Uh, on an on an open basis, I think you all know how many models do we have in the hub. I think also Lilian uh, before made a really uh, fair point in terms of quality or performance. One thing is to have, for instance, Bloom, a 176 billion parameters large language model. One year and a half or two years uh, and a half, it was very, very, uh, let's say, weird to have these kind of models on an open source basis for the, for the community to use. Nowadays, we are not anymore in the race of, in the race of who is training the biggest, uh, largest model is more we are on the race of who is releasing on an open basis before the others a more sniper or high quality model. Because nowadays, um, large language models, and we are speaking about maybe between 50 or even over 100 billion parameter models are not the main focus. The main focus nowadays is going to be on sniper models such as JAMA. So something in between 7 billion and 12 billion parameters model from which the training to training the model, so may, let's say a pure computational perspective, maybe it's between 100K and 200K. Uh, so you are uh, decreasing the cost of training these models. Now, of course, if we are um, speaking about competing with um, GPT-4, by far you need more. Perfect. Thanks, Carlos. Really important points. And I know we've only got a little bit of time, but I hope we can, Chiara, can we go back to the questions people have posed and see where we are? Great. Um, okay, so we have a new leader at the top um, from Alexander Chiu. Is Alexander here? I think he'll be online. Online. Okay, so I'm going to read the question out. Would you agree, and we can see who wants to take this, would you agree that one, the legal basis for data? Pre trained. Personal, personal data. Personal data processing in LLMs is the same as for Google search. Good question. And are de defamation issues solved by filtering after notice? <laughs> I think Alexander and me have been discussing this online in various social media sites. So he's actually an ex-student of my, my master's at Strathclyde, okay. I believe, uh, but now an independent consultant. So I think, yeah, this, this is the key GDPR problem, right? You know, I, as as is commonly said, and perhaps I'm overstating, but you know, a lot of these models are being built by hoovering up data, much of which is personal data in terms of the GDPR, some of which is sensitive personal data in terms of the GDPR, which is this bundle of categories such as health data, sexual data, political data, religious data, etc. Right, that that identify that is identifiably related to a person. Okay. So the problem then is, well, let's take sensitive personal data because it's the toughie, right? Is that that is only generally for a private company able to be processed, which includes collecting it, editing it, mining it, doing all the things you do with explicit consent, which you absolutely don't have, you know. So that's the killer, right? The slightly less killer is ordinary personal data where you've got a few more choices for a lawful ground for processing. So as well as consent, you've got what they call legitimate interests, the legitimate interests of the provider of, say, OpenAI. Um, but that has to be balanced against the interests of the users of the data subjects, yes. right? Both of these are incredibly problematic. And the argument that I've been kind of not making, but kind of noodling around with, is that the nearest analogy is the Google Spain case, which most people know as the right to be forgotten case, the case that introduced that right, which would then became the right to erasure in the GDPR. And if you look at Google, it looks quite like it. You know, they, they ingest data by their crawlers all over the internet without asking people. Then they make it into a model. And then they have outputs from the model, which contain huge amounts of private personal data, you know, in a way which the case describes as, you know, really, really incursive into your privacy because it provides this detailed systematic picture of your activity all over the internet, right? Which you couldn't get just from looking at individual websites, right? And yet, the court has managed, the, the European Court of Justice has managed by a bit of slate of hand, really, um, to legitimize Google because we can't live without Google search effectively, or, you know, I could now add Bing, et cetera, um, 
by by really by trickery really i think it'd be fair to say so they what, what's the trickery that makes sense? Uh, well the trickery isn't so much with legitimate interest to get to legitimate interest they argued that it wasn't just that you had to look at the data subjects interest in privacy which was clearly impinged but you also had to look at the world the public's interest in access to information Right, which you can take from freedom of expression, which you can take from the the EU Charter of Rights. Is there also an argument you haven't impinged on the individual because it was out there for anyone to find on the net anyway? No, no, that's the American argument. Um, That's the idea that once it's out there, it's fair game. That is not the European view. If the data makes you identifiable or identified and it relates to you, then it is personal data and you have rights to control it. Understood. So some people might say that now these foundation models are even better than Google search, arguably at at putting pieces of information together. But you would say that makes no difference, at least in Europe, to the legal case. I would say it makes every difference. The argument I'm making in the talk tomorrow is indeed that you can map what, say, ChatGPT or GPT-4 does very closely to what Google search Well, you're saying it's the same same thing. So you end up possibly, yes, with an argument that you may be able to apply legitimate interests to legitimize the gathering of data by chat GPT or by, by other generative models. But I think it does get harder with sensitive personal data. Right. And that's actually where I almost ground to a halt to say I have a whole talk on this because there are different issues. If you talk about does a right of erasure give you a right to take data out the training set, which might be relatively easy. But in fact, my understanding is that you throw away the training set anyway. Is that right? So that's not really the worry of the the providers. Or does it mean you have the right to take the data out the model? What does that mean? Um, And does it just mean what it meant in what they got down to meaning in Google Spain, which is that you might delete a particular output related to a particular named person, which presumably is relatively easy to do with a filter, like you were talking about a shallow filter. But these, these outputs are always going to keep coming, right? You haven't stopped them. Um, and what's even worse When you move on from there, even if you took that least harmful interpretation, which is it's a bit like delinking, then you've got rectification. And I do not see how rectification can be done because of the hallucination effect, right? So the next time someone asks for information about me, they're going to get a different set of hallucinations, as I understand. It's an open technical problem whether you can reliably. Yeah. yeah. So I think there is there are two. There is an immovable force meeting a kind of you know irresistible object here, and there will have to be some sensible resolution. I can't see that generative AI will be banned from the planet because of the failure to provide a fairly artificial definition of rectification. So I think you know at that point there are some tricks you can use, such as you can look at things like proportionality. You know, would this be a proportional result? And indeed, I think there's a lot more work needed to be done. This is yet another talk I'm working on, on what the correct remedies are here. Just wondering, is it, thinking along that lines, what if, thinking about proportionality, what if I argue, I'm not saying this is the case, but what if I were to argue, well, it's fine to get other people's sensitive data, but my one in particular is really important mm. because if you release it, it's going to cause some massive problem for me personally, I'll have to commit suicide. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the nearest, again, analogy, and I've been just searching around for analogies, as as everyone, is libel. Okay, libel seems very unimportant, but at least we have some case law on it. So the argument with libel is this thing is spat out by the model you know, the cases we have are about Google search and it causes my reputation to be wrecked, right? Which might lead to me losing my livelihood, losing, that's losing not the my model, partner, li- you know, creating But that's the problem for whoever's published that information. And, and Yes, know. yes. So that again, there has been some clever slate of hand on that one, right? So we had a case in the UK in which for libel, which is extremely esoteric, the court managed to decide that Google was not a common law publisher because they didn't have enough intention, basically, to publish. They were just kind of this neutral, automated intermediary. Now, I think that is not going to fly with these models. 
you know, because they are very intentionally making these models. They're making a lot of money out of them. You could have said the same things about Google search, but I just think the world has changed. It's going to be very hard to make that argument. So, yeah, the fake news, disinformation, libel access, I think remains very, very difficult. I wonder what you think. No, we've just got a couple of minutes, but <laughs> yeah, any, any final comments? Um, I, I think just going back to the, the core issue of um, legal basis, I think that uh, one thing that I will say is that we, based on Google Blue Spain and a number of other sort of uh, developments in this space, we've started to think sort of thing like um, GDPR reliance on uh, legitimate interest is the gold standard. That was sort of the messaging that we were getting from regulators to begin with, because they said, well, consent is actually an extremely high bar. It's not very easy to obtain. How often can you keep consenting and for what? And it's just, you know, it's a blocker to a service. There was a lot of lobbying around it. So we sort of moved away from, um, from reliance on legitimate interest. Um, we're now seeing that tide weirdly turn into to some degree almost going to this sort of American approach to sort of if you consent to this, then you do whatever you'd like to buy. Uh, data. So if we look at recent enforcement trends, and I think we're going to start to see some of this come out in uh, guidance, which is expected later this year from the EDPB on, on legitimate interest, there is a swing towards saying, hold on, these large organizations, tech companies and so on, don't seem to be able to get legitimate interest right so for now, we're going to ask you to go back to the users, please get their consent for whatever you'd like to do with that information, particularly health data. But one could argue that there wouldn't be that much health data in large language models, because how would you get access to it unless you've got access to NHS databases or so on? Um, uh, but there could still be other forms of problematic personal data out there. Sorry. Well, just just saying, there's yet another wrinkle on this, yeah. which is health data, sexual data, etc., are very likely revealed by the process of machine learning. And we already have this recent case in Lithuania yeah. um, that, that reinforces what we've known all along, which is that basically if personal data is gathered, which then reveals sensitive personal data, then it is sensitive personal data. Yeah. I think we, I think we, we've not. Uh, the clock hasn't yet run out unless I'm, I've, uh, I'm behind on my research on the guarantees requirements of um, open API. One of the things that they have to disclose quite transparently is what lawful basis they're relying on. So I think once we get to see that, uh, a lot of uh, um, Alexander's um, questions may sort of be addressed, at least from the industry's perspective. In a week, because that will be a big. Yeah. <laughs> William, any final words? Uh, uh, no final words. I imagine there are many smart people who work at uh, at Google who maybe provide a better answer to these questions. But I will say, on the technical side, I will say, like you know, as I mentioned, we were going back and forth. Um, it's not exactly clear from a model standpoint how we'll achieve some of these things that are desired, right? So you mentioned, like you know, we've seen examples outside of large language models and like image diffusion models um, where they've tried to you know balance like the rights holders of artists by allowing them to kind of opt out right of the pre-training data but once it's in the pre-training data you know it's it's a much more difficult challenge and in fact i actually think it might be more challenging if you remove the data because you lost time you're looking for signals or examples of memorization and that's the kind of signal you need to be able to make a claim so the how you actually kind of partition like you know whether include the data or not is, I think, more complex. Um, but I, I would imagine one of the troubles is, is that what you will inevitably go towards is trying to use, at least in the in intermediate term, using more simplistic, well, simplistic is a, a relative term, but more straightforward machine learning classifiers to be able to filter and kind of like augment the model outputs. And uh, those might be run into the same kind of questions that we've always had about um, whether or not machine learning models are trustworthy or transparent, et cetera. So this, I, I imagine it will get worse before it gets better in terms of providing clarity about how you align the technical infrastructure with the legal requirements. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there, but there's so many more open technical, legal, philosophical, societal questions. Uh, we didn't ask Carlos for his last word. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's true, but Carlos did have a chance. Well, Carlos, do you have any anything final to add? Yeah, nothing. Uh, nothing new that you did and that the other speakers already told. Maybe you are aware that we are. I can I can spend a, one minute on this. We are finishing uh, the training. Uh, 
big code. So big code is going to be a large language model for code generation. Um, we released the, the first thing we released on an open basis was the training data set uh, made out of uh, uh, open source repositories with an open source permissive license. Um, related to uh, where personal data related concerns and copyright related concerns, for instance, uh, aside developing PII detection and filtering, um, well, we also developed an opt-out mechanism for any uh, software developer who do not, who does not want to or or, or doesn't wish um, that their model, uh, sorry, their their source code repo is within uh, the stack. So the training data set. We also understood that if we started to train the model, all uh, potential output, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, um, applications uh, were not going or we were not going to be able. Um, to satisfy them because the model will be um, in the training phase. So what we did is to create a data search tool. So basically every single uh, user of big code, whenever the, whenever the model is going to output code, uh, they can copy paste the, this code within the data search tool. And then the data search tool will find this code within uh, the training data set and identify uh, a with, uh, so identify if uh, the code was uh, or is effectively within the training data set or not, and if it is in which uh, GitHub uh, open source repo and which is the license basically. So uh, in this way, every single time the model generates output, you as a developer are able to check uh, license compliance if this code string is already copied from an already available open source repo. Thanks very much, Carla. So, yeah, anyone interested in open source tool, tools, check out Hugging Face. Um, and uh, I know we're, we're over time, so let's just uh, thank all of our speakers. Thank Lillian um, and um, uh, and William and um, uh, Arnav. Arnav, Arnav, thank you, and Carlos, um, all for, for being such great uh, speakers and panelists. Thanks very much.